So hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this teach-in. Um, basically what we're going to do is as a follow-up to the session that we had in um, December, I believe, yes, beginning of December, um, where we talked about what CRT was and it was a whole panel I was on, it was with two brilliant, brilliant um, people. Um, we wanted to actually show you what, uh, it means to infuse equity into our lessons and um, the way that we teach. And so we have three educators joining us today to kind of explain um, the process. We're going to have them each, um, we're gonna have them each present their lesson. And then we're going to have a time period where you all get to just sit, write down your questions. We're going to be quiet. I'll put you on a little timer. Write down your questions, et cetera. And then we will go to the next person. And then at the end, we're going to be having, um, we're going to have a question and answer sessions. Um, so I would like to make sure each of you, as you are listening, that you have a, a piece of paper and a pen. Because again, I'm going to give you, after each one, I'm going to give you three minutes to reflect on um, what you learned, questions that you still have, et cetera. All right, so we're going to begin with Ms. Brittany Fatoma. Did I say that right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Brittany Fatoma is a leader, activist, and educator. She is a Southern Belle from North Carolina and a proud HBCU graduate of Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, she received her undergraduate degree in elementary education and later attended La Sierra University and graduated with a master's degree in educational administration and leadership. After spending eight years at a, as an elementary school teacher and teaching methods coach, Brittany is pursuing an EDD in educational leadership, policy, and analysis at the University of Missouri. Her current research is Black female educator attrition in K through 12. Presently, Brittany serves as the graduate assistant for the McNair Scholars Program at, at MU and the founder of the ICU Teachers of Color Support Network, or TCSN. TCSN is a Worley Street Roundtable initiative that seeks to support and retain Black and Brown educators in mid-Missouri. <clears throat> WSR um, is a grassroots and nonprofit organization that partners with the local school district, parents, teachers, and community members to address the educational disparities and disproportionalities in the lack of success and access among students of color in Columbia, Missouri. Brittany is passionate about her community and working together to create safe and equitable spaces for everyone, especially black and brown people. So thank you very much. Brittany, and I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Heather. I was like, ooh, I like this lady she's talking about. <laughs> it's me. All right, everyone, we're going to get right into it. I am so excited. Let's go. Okay, so let me make sure. Okay, cool. Now, you will see me going time to time looking to the, what is that, my left might look like you're right on your screen. And that's only so that I can um, see my screen. I have a double screen. All right. Mapping our community connection to slavery is the title of our lesson today. Okay. And like I said, I am thrilled to share space with all of you, even though we know that this is a um, lesson of how being in fourth grade, I still want to say that I'm, I'm excited about sharing space. And I'm always excited to share space with my students. Um, and I always make this joke that I am your host today. We gonna have fun. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm excited. Let's go. All right. So I always like to start off with the land acknowledgement. I also think it's important to do this in the classroom as well. Just know the origin of where you are and the importance of the land. Now, I am one, a person that believes it's important to honor the names of people. Um, and since I didn't get a good opportunity to practice these names, I'm not going to butcher them, but I do want you to see them so we can still get honor to these tribes that inhabit this land. So we know that this land was colonized as Missouri. That was not the name of this land. And then you can see the following are the tribal nations that we know of, right? 
Um, I, I do believe from my research that there are other tribes. We just don't necessarily know their names, but this was their homeland. The atrocities of the forced removal of the indigenous people and their displacement is a travesty. Presently, the state isn't home to a single federally recognized tribe, and we'll break that down more in the lesson. Furthermore, the land was developed by enslaved Africans of whom their descendants still fight today to be appreciated and honored in this country. However, the pandemic of white supremacy thinking and action holds all captive. My hope and my prayer today is that I may might disrupt, challenge and interrogate our socialization so that maybe some of us, just some of us might get out of the sunken place. Um, and so hopefully as a fourth grader, you might not have seen the movie Get Out, but as adults, I know you have, so I think you will get that, that, um, that connection. If not, go ahead and use Google. It is very meaningful and helpful when we don't know what things are. All right. Also like to open up with a quote. Hold on. I'm sorry. Looks like one of my emails. Number. I don't know if it's blocking my screen or not, but anyways. Um, so. While history is what happened, it is also just as important how we think about what happened and we unearth and choose to remember what about what happened. I chose this quote to kind to the kind of set the tone for our lesson today. This was written by Nicole Hannah Jones, who is the mastermind, the innovator of the 1619 project, not the 1618, excuse that 18. Um, and I thought that I was so fitting to really capture what we're going to be talking about today. It is not enough to just know what happened. We got, we have to not only know it, we have to think it, we have to um, take it upon ourselves so that we can be instrumental in making sure that we do not continue the mistakes and the errors of, of our history. It's not to shame or to bash. There is no condemnation, okay? We want to move forward with knowledge so that we can make a better, better tomorrow for those that come behind us. All right, so our intentions, you all know being in my class that we always want to set to the ground rules, how we want to operate, how we want to speak to each other. So we wanna be kind. It's nothing wrong with having an opinion. We all have one, but we wanna be kind and we wanna be respectful and we wanna be present. I realize that there may be 50 million things that you are thinking about, but right now in this time, in this space, I want you to focus. And as we share, as we engage in this topic, there may be some challenging things that make you feel uncomfortable and that is okay. There may be some things you're like, Ms. Potoma, I don't agree. Thank you. You don't have to agree with me. I want you to challenge me. I want you to say, I, I don't know about that. That is good. That means you're critically thinking. You're not just passively taking information. I just ask that you be respectful. And likewise, I want to be respectful, respectful to you. But if by chance I do disrespect you, let me know. Okay. Now y'all know we about that call out culture, but if it's a classmate to do it, please don't call them out. If it's Ms. Potoma does it, Call me out. You know, I don't mind. Go ahead. Get me. Get me right. I don't mind it at all. So now that we have our norms, we can go into our objective. All right. So our learning objective, what we're learning today, I can explain to whom Missouri's land belonged to before it was colonized by the U.S. So y'all know I like to do the call and response. So when I say I can, you say I can. I can explain to whom Missouri's land Missouri's belonged land to. belonged. Thank you. <laughs> before, before it was colonized. It was colonized by the U.S. By the U.S. All right. So, you know, before we got started, we got out our supplies, but just in case you got a little distracted, it happens. Make sure you have your iPad, your notebook, and your pencil. If by chance you do not have one, you know you can just get up, grab it, and get right back to your seat so we can get this thing going. Because as you can tell, I'm so excited. I got the excited jitter because jitter, this is a really exciting lesson. All right. As you know that um, we have standards. We have standards that apply to every fourth grader in the state of Missouri, which is great. That means 
we here in Columbia learn the same thing as those in Kansas City, those in St. Louis. And so these are what these standards are. You know, we read them and we make sure that we have generally a, a, a good understanding of. Sometimes the words can be a little tricky, but we try to make sure we understand. So this comes, so this standard is actually two part. Okay, so this is the first part, and then we'll go into the second part. So Missouri Standard 3AA, remember that's call and response, y'all ready? Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge of continuity, of continuity, of, continuity, of change in the history, of change, of change in the history, history of Missouri and the United States, of Missouri and the United States. So remember the knowledge is talking about the, you know, the information that we know, continuity is the flow, the continuous, right? And then we know change in history. All right, we're gonna go right into the next part of our standard. Oh, I skipped this slide. Okay, so I don't know how to get, oh, yes I do, there it goes. <laughs> okay, but you know, next time if I do that, I need my IT tech, don't, don't, you don't have to wait. Help Miss Plum out. Don't have her out here drowning in my lesson because of technical issues. All right. So the next part of our standard. Now, this one has three points. What's highlighted is what we are going to touch on today. More specifically, that first part. But I know um, in my overview and some of the things we talked about in our um, and our read aloud, we, it touches on that. So that's why I highlighted both, okay? So remember, still call and response. Remember, if you talk it, hear it, do it, you're more inclined to learn it. So I know you're like, Mr. Tom, how much, how many times we're gonna do this? But it's important and we gotta do it. And sometimes we just gotta do stuff we don't like to do. And it's cool. All right, so make sure I'm, I'm ready. You ready? All right, describe. Describe. The mig migrations of Native Americans. The migrations of Native Americans prior to 1800. Prior to 1800. All right. The second one, discovery. Discovery. Exploration. Exploration. An early settlement. An early settlement. Of America by Europeans. Of America by Europeans. Prior to 1800. Prior to 1800. And then we're still going to read the last part, but I'll let your voices get a break and I'll just read it. But that's the last part of the standard. But remember, we're not covering this part today. Reasons African peoples were enslaved and brought to the Americas prior, prior to 1800. Now, again, this is part one of our lesson. We will get into that. We just won't get into it today. All right. Vocab check. Vocab check. All right. So there's two words that are going to come out in our lesson. Okay, um, the first one is colonized. What did I say? Colonized. Awesome. A group of individuals that settle among the native people and establish political control. So a, an example of that is me coming into your house and saying, um, I know how y'all do things here, but that's over, that's, that's done. I'm going to run this place. We're going to have dinner at 6 a.m. And we're going to do lunch. I oh, forget lunch. We're not going to do that. Oh, you get to watch TV once you don't do the homework. No, throw out the TV. It's me coming in and saying I'm in control. How, how would you feel about that? Probably not great. Right. So that's what that's that's a like a real life example of what it means to colonize. And then migration. What was what, what that word again? Migration. Yes, is moving from one place to another. Um, and, and the great thing, uh, a great example of that is just how we move. I always think I migrated, and y'all know I love talking about how I'm not from Missouri. I migrated to Missouri from the great state of North Carolina. And, you know, it was, it was rough, but I'm, I'm getting better. You know, 10 years in, I'm starting to finally be like, okay, I'll be okay. All right. Our lesson. So, how the U.S. became to be. So, we talked a little bit about this in our in our reader lab when we were looking at the different websites about about how the U.S. became to be. So, this is a little bit of a review. 
So first, there was this idea that the earth was flat. And so they decided they need to explore and, and debunk this fact. And they did. They found out, oh, it's not flat. There is other things or other land besides us. And when we're th- talking about us, we're talking about um, Spain. We're talking about Great Britain. We're talking about um well, Africa was included too, um, but we're talking about those big powers. And um, because they, they, they knew that they needed to explore, they began to think that they were discovering things. Now, if these, and that's something that I want to challenge you to really think, did they really discover these things or were they already there? Okay, I want you to start thinking about, did they really discover? So anyways, this idea of exploration was mainly to gain power. The concept that the more land you had equal the more money you had and the more power you had. And that was so important for these countries during this time. We need to have our, we need to have our land, we need to have our power and we need to have our money. And I would like to ask too, has, has too much changed? Hmm, something to think about. All right, and so then this idea of colonization or colonizing, that means forcing the indigenous people off the land. And so we're gonna get a little bit more into that. All right, so as I referred a few times to our read aloud, and you know, we use our read aloud to get gain information about things that we don't know about. And so we did a read aloud on a few of our websites, and this is some of the information that we pulled. If you remember, we did, it was like a T-chart, and we kind of, what we thought we knew about something, and then what we actually learned. So this is where this comes from, okay? So we discovered that 12,000 B.C., that the indigenous tribes, which remember we gave them a name because we wanted to practice how properly pronouncing the names. And it was a little bit of a challenge because um, their names are not something that are names that we are accustomed to. And so we gave them the name, the seven original tribes colonized into Missouri. And so that way we can give honor to their name. And we just don't just say any old thing just because it's, it's their name and we want to honor that. Okay. So, but we still want to listen there so we can honor them. All right. So then in 1673, white Frenchmen colonized the territory for trade and to prevent Great Britain from expanding. And remember, we were like, what? They did what? That we found, we found that very interesting. So then it goes on with the conflict between the French and the British. There was the French and Indian War, and we, and we discussed that. And we even discussed that the indigenous and native people actually fought on both sides. Then by 1763, France gave, um, gave the territory to Spain. And then in 1800, Spain, uh, France bought it back. So we saw there was a little bit of tennis back and forth, back and forth. And so finally France sold the Louisiana territory which included um, Missouri um, to the U.S. Okay, I was trying to make sure I didn't get ahead of myself. All right. Did I get, oh, I think I did. Hold on. All right. And then the last part is in 1830, there was the Indian Removal Act, which was the forcing of the um, indigenous and native people of the area to go elsewhere. They were forcibly removed from their homes. And we talked about how that made us feel, um, how we can uh, how we can make that connection, um, how how we could imagine if we were forced from our homes. We even had some students open up, which I was so proud of you all creating a safe space for them to talk about what they felt like when they had to be removed from their homes, um, from their parents. Um, and so we could really, although we could really empathize and understand a little bit about what some of those people experienced because we were able to connect it to real things happening in our lives. All right, so now that We've gone through the lesson and we've reviewed over what we learned in our read aloud. Now it's time for knockout. All right, so we're gonna do a knockout debate, all right? All right, don't be nervous, don't be nervous. It's not our first time, it's not our first time, okay? This is gonna be great. So 
because we have our T chart and the things that we learned, you have a little bit of a little bit of information already, but you're free. That's why you have your iPad to do more research. So with this debate, this is the question. Should the seven original tribes be federally recognized? Now, I know you're like, Mr. Potoma, what is federally recognized again? So to be federally recognized means that the tribes and groups have a special legal relationship to the United States government. So basically they have access to resources that they would not normally have access to if they were not federally recognized. So we split the class in two. We split the class in two, and one side is going to be, yes, they should be federally recognized, and the other class is like, other side of the class is, no, they should not be. Now, I realize these are big groups, so I need you to speak now if you feel like you're uncomfortable and these groups are too big. Okay. All right, so let's break the groups up into more. Why don't we use, oh, I know, we can use our science, science experiment groups. Let's do our science experiment groups. Is that better? Okay, so, but it's, I'm still going to have half and half. Half is still, half is still yes, and other half is no. Okay, you want to do it fairly? Okay, let me put some, some things in the head. All right, shake it up. All right, now you choose. Now this is fair. Remember, we 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 try to we try to be fair here. We def or we right, we're, you're right. We don't do fair, we do equitable. We try to be equitable in here. All right, so I, I mix it up, mix it up. All right, everybody choose. So now we know which side. All right, so you're gonna research, create an argument. And debate. You don't have a lot of time for this. You have five minutes. I know that's scary. Five minutes, but you can do it, okay? So remember, you're going to have somebody do the research, creating the argument, and then you need to have your spokesperson. And then we're going to get this debate look out started. And if we run out of time, you know, we can definitely continue on to the next day. All right. Our, our mini lesson wrap up. Those were some really great debates. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, so I so uh, y'all know I like to record. I said we re, we post these on our class TikTok and let the people decide who won the debate. All right. I think that I think that's fair. So then I don't have to be in that uncomfortable position to choose because I don't think I could choose. All right. So today we learned I can explain to whom Missouri's land belonged to before it was colonized by the U.S. In the lesson, we gave honor to the original tribes that were colonized in the state of Missouri. And then in closing, this is where your social studies journal comes in. I want you to write, I want you to write and think, how did colonization impact the indigenous people? And so this is time for you to just write and think, get it out. For some people you're like, oh, I can't quite put the words, sketch it out. Um, do notes, you know, I love me a good T-chart. I just want you to take time to really focus in on this last part of our lesson. How did colonization impact the indigenous people? Then once you're done, put your little, your, your bookmark in it and turn it in at the back table so that I can read your responses. And like that, I am done. Yay! So this is what I would like everyone to do first. Um, very good job, Fatoma. Um, I almost said Fatoma, Miss Fatoma. Um, and there's just so much that I like. So this is what we're going to do right now. Again, we're going to give people an opportunity to just sit and reflect and write. This is the English teacher in me. So I'm going to set a timer. And we're going to have quiet time for three minutes so that you all have the opportunity, those that are listening, to think about, number one, I think a really good question is, what were the aspects of that lesson that really um, got you excited or, or you know, um, or, or charged, supercharged? But then the other thing would be, what questions do you have about the ways that students might engage in that lesson, okay? Dave, my understanding is that it is fourth grade, right, Ms. Fatoma? Yes, it is. It came straight from our fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And so I was amazed because I'm sitting here like, wow, these kids are going to be learning uh, such good information um, at a fourth grade level. You talk about rigor. That is rigor. And uh, I think that that's one of the things that kind of comes up in conversation sometimes is it's like that we have to have equity or rigor. And in actuality, 
this is an example of how we could have both. And so again, I'm going to give you three minutes to just sit, write, and reflect and start. Okay. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Time is up. And so I know that you probably have lots of questions. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and allow our next presenter to present. And um, if you do have questions or comments that you want to share, please place those into the chat for us. Um, kind of look at all like me, I took a bunch of notes and look, oh, you can't see it because of my blurred thing, but a bunch of notes, some really great questions. Go ahead and post some of those, your best ones in the chat for us, okay? Thank you very much, Brittany. We really appreciate it. That was wonderful. Okay, our next um, presenter is Miss Chloe Telly. I know it says more. But I've met I've met Daniel, so I know that her name is, in fact, Chloe Telly. Um, okay, Chad, can we get Chloe at the center? Awesome. So Chloe, let me. Your bio is short, sweet, and to the point, so I'll add what I want to add to it, okay? Chloe Telly is a 14-year English teacher who is passionate about equity and the power of storytelling. She is not only politically active, but she is a mus musician and a speaker. In addition, Chloe teaches contemporary literature and world lit literature at Webster Groves High School. And I can also tell you this, that this woman is an incredibly passionate um, educator, a wonderful friend. Um, she's hilarious. Uh, it keeps me laughing <laughs> and it's just wonderful. So Chloe, take it away, ma'am. All right. And Brittany, don't go anywhere after all <laughs> this. Don't, don't go anywhere. So today's lesson, and I, I want to share my screen with you. Let's see here. Look, excuse all the different. Okay, everyone. So when we talk about literacy, right? Part of the reason why we're not a literate society is because we're not a listening society. And I want you all to take that in. I want every teacher on here to stop telling your students to follow and lie. First of all, I cannot stand the term high interest reading. Don't use it anymore. Because what we've done is we have taught people that unless something is relevant to them, it's not worth listening to. I know I preach. You all don't got to say nothing behind that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm not gonna say nothing behind it. I, I'm not. Yeah, I did that because if I teach myself that the only thing that's important when I read is me, I can't decenter myself. Think about the conversations you've had about race, where people can't decenter themselves, and the questions never really get around to understanding other people. It doesn't because, have you noticed, because of all of what we do in education, you very rarely hear listening as the key. I teach listening as a part of reading and as a part of writing. If you're a poor listener, you will not listen to your text, and you will not listen to anybody else so that you can process it, so you can write about it. So this morning, that's all right. I got you. If you're a poor listener, that's okay. I got you this morning. We're going to learn how to listen this morning. That's all right. I teach at the high school level. So, you know, we kind of have the sort of conversations like everybody, let's do a hair and let's do an eyelash check before we get started because we cannot be ragged tea while we listen. Okay. So now that I see that you're all beautiful people, 
We're beautiful the way we are. Let's look at this. Be the change you want to see. When you teach people how to listen, I want everybody to prepare. Even your body language helps you out. You have to be present, okay? Be present when you talk to people. You come prepared to listen, not to respond. Be non-judgmental. When people talk, don't start telling them how their story didn't happen. That's our problem. And if you do that during conversation, chances are you also tune people out during the reading process. Be a note taker. Let people know they're important. Take some notes. But most importantly, be inquisitive to understand and not to discredit. This is what happens when people don't understand the power dynamics of conversations. Even when we read people's books, we as a reader are powerful. We can dismiss someone's voice. We can dismiss someone's voice during a conversation. We don't want to be those people, okay? So I'm going to show you how to be the change you want to see. We're going to do the four C's. We're going to be, we're going to make a connection. We're going to be curious. We're going to be compassionate and we're going to be a community. We don't teach people this enough. And we wonder why we have folks not wanting to listen while they read or raise their hand and say, Mr. and Miss so-and-so, I don't want to read this book because I'm not interested in it. We didn't ask you whether you were interested. You need to be prepared to listen to somebody else's view on life, even if you're not interested. Take notes and learn something. Come as a learner and not somebody to be entertained. Do you all see where this comes in together? Because we're not listeners, it's affecting our reading instruction and we're creating poor writers as a result of it. It all goes together. If I can teach you while reading how to make a connection, how to be curious while you're reading that beautiful history uh, lesson, if I can teach you compassion because you're listening, think about how, think about the difference in the output. But most importantly, be a community. Now, Miss Telly, how do you teach all of this? You have to intentionally teach your students how to be listeners. And this is why I want every teacher. Yes, this is for high school, but we can take this to every grade level. That's the beauty of this. This must be one of our day one lessons. It'll make a difference. When you talk about equity, equity is about listening to folks who are normally listened to. Equity is about me saying, I'm not interested in your story and I have the power to dismiss your story. But if we teach them how to be listeners, we will cut that behavior out. Okay, we're going to cut that out. And Heather is going to help me this morning. She is going to help me cut that behavior out. Heather is so prepared. She is so ready. Okay. Now, what you're going to see in this format is Heather tell me a story for about approximately three minutes. And I want to show you the, well, look, okay, just, okay, well, however, you deem worthy, okay, Heather? (laughs) Yes, ma'am. Yes, Miss Sally. Okay. She's going to tell me a story. And during that story, you will see me be an active listener. You're going to see me take notes about what she's saying. Then I want you to notice how I connect with her. I want you to notice how I invoke curiosity. And I want you to notice the language I use to connect with her. I want you to notice that. You can take this to your classroom. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to let Heather speak. First of all, Heather. Yes. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you, Miss Sally. Thank you. And if you could, the floor is yours. Um, what do I tell a story about? Hmm. Huh. See, that's what you get for putting me on the spot. Um, we. <sighs> See, I don't even know. Oh, I know. Here's one of my favorite stories. So I used to work at um, the Division of Child Support Enforcement, and I had a part-time, because I, as I was becoming a teacher, 
I um, went part time so that I could, you know, finish my studies and do my student teaching. And a friend of mine that worked there with us also worked at, you know, what used to be the Keele Auditorium. I don't even know what it's called now, but worked there and Prince was coming. And so I sat there and I kept talking to her about the fact that I wanted to see Prince so badly, but I could not get tickets. And the day of the concert, she walks into my office, she closes my door, and she hands me four tickets to Prince. Needless to say, I screamed. I went to my um, supervisor's office. I said, I'll see y'all later. And I left because we had to go because it was my sister and I, we had to go and get our outfits that Prince was going to see us in. And so we get there and I'll never forget, we decided, okay, we're going to be like, smart about this the parking right there at the um at the stadium was ten dollars and we thought well if we parked a little bit further it might be less expensive that was not the truth and so apparently everyone else had that same idea they parked way over there we end up having to walk very very far from union station to kill our um, stadium and i'll never forget that as we're walking in we hear the music and so we start running faster going faster well i'm five foot nine my sister is five foot three and so as you can imagine she was a little behind me and at one point i realized she wasn't next to me at all and so i turned around and i looked and she was kind of doubled over. And I said, Stacy, what's wrong? And she said, I feel like baby trolls are eating my ankles right now. And we laughed so hard right there in the middle of the parking lot. But the cool part is that we got to see Prince and it was one of the most phenomenal concerts I've ever been to in my life. There's my story, Miss Telly. Thank you for telling your story. So. So Heather, when you, when you, when you said, when you said you were surprised by your coworker, in that moment, could you could you go further with how you said you were fe- how you were feeling in that moment? Oh, it was a combination of excitement and joy and anticipation. There was just a lot because. That was kind of a dream of mine. Prince was always part of my childhood. And here I was at 30 something, able to go and see him in concert. As you were telling your story, one aspect that struck me was when you said you looked around and, and your and your sister was not there. Mm-hmm. What what were you thinking at that at that moment? In that moment? <laughs> I honestly, I was thinking, oh Lord, I have left this woman behind because her little legs can, can't keep up with mine. And sure enough, I had. <laughs> so I had to go back and, and take care of her and make sure we caught up. One aspect of your story that I absolutely love is the way that you had a spirit of humility while telling this story. You you seem and, and that just and that just really struck me. How does this how does this particular story affect you today? Oh, it still makes me laugh and it still makes me um, happy because it's one of the you know you always are excited to build memories with your your sister. She lives down in Alabama um, now, so we don't have as many opportunities to spend time together, and it just reminds me of that. Does this change, did that moment change how, how you connect with other people, that moment, the idea that someone would surprise you in this manner? Um, it does, because I remember that the, the woman in, in um, question, like we had different political beliefs, um, you know, 
she voted one way, I voted another way. Um, we were like the exact opposite of one another. She was a very short white woman. Here I am, a tall black woman. She was thin. I was thicker. Um, you know, it just, it, it was very, very, um, uh, it was, it was amazing of her. And it's a memory I always uh, remember, but she always did stuff for like even my kids um, because she worked at the blues. There was so much stuff that she got, you know, like this person, bread hole stick or that person's um, the, the hockey puck for the game. So there was a connection there that even though we were on different sides and we had differences of opinions, there were so many th uh, more things in common that we had. So I always remember Becky very well. So, so that's, sh that strikes me that this person was opposite from you. How does that inform your work today with, with equity? How does that inform it? Um, it reminds me to listen to people's stories, just like we're doing right now. Um, and to look beyond just, you know, at times the, the surface stuff. Um, it reminds me of what we're trying to get to. So we're not there yet with um, just judging people by the content of their character. But I remember, it reminds me that we need to continue to always try because I, I she was one of the best people I've ever met. Seriously, it was a pleasure to work with her. Heather, thank you for your story. Thank, thank you, you for sharing you. that. And I want to kind of, because I'm getting short on time and I don't want to go over, or I could do the church thing and just say the spirit hit me and keep moving. <laughs> I will do that. I wanted you all to take from this at one, not at one point that I try to give Heather my opinion. It was all questioning. Just one question to understand. This is what we have to start out with, with our students. This will help with their reading. And it's also research. <clears throat> This helps with research too. So I'm going to calmly bring this to a close. All my resources came from the International Institute for Restorative Practices, because that is one thing I did leave out. I am, I am working towards being a restorative justice practitioner. So thank you all. And I'm going to kind of let it glide. Yes. Okay. So that was, that was cool. That was so cool, um, Chloe, even though, excuse me, Miss Telly, that was so cool, even though you put me on the spot. And at one point she complimented me and she knows I'm not comfortable with it. And I was like, she did that on purpose. <laughs> so I'm going to give you all again, time to write. And so let's start the clock again. And I want you to take the three minutes to write down your thoughts, your feedback, your questions, okay? And then, and, and then just again, um, we are going to, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, we are going to um, upload our best questions into our best comments into the chat. So begin now. Okay, time. All right. Thank you, Miss Telly. I appreciate you. Now, our third and final um, panelist to present is Maggie Klonsky. Now, Maggie, I'm going to shorten some of this just a little bit. <laughs> um, Maggie currently serves as an interim executive director of We Stories, a nonprofit that helps families start and strengthen conversations around race, about race and racism. We Stories fosters a community where families engage in lifelong learning and advocate um, for change in spaces where they live, work, and play. Um, she was involved with We Stories for a while. She even served on the board for almost six years. Um, the last two years, she served as board president before taking over as the interim um, director. She has a BA in psychology with a minor in leadership and public service from the University of Missouri-Columbia. Um, she 
went into education through Teach for America, and then she earned her MA in education um, teach and, and teaching from Alliance International University in San Francisco. Um, she taught at the Marion Middle School for several years. Um, she also taught in East San Jose, California. Um, middle school is what she used to teach. And she recently completed a leadership development cohort. Um, oh, that's me. Okay. <laughs> it was my leadership development cohort. The um, leaders in anti-racism equity, excuse me, equity, anti-racism and parity or LEAP Institute that I offer through um, in purpose educational services. Maggie did successfully complete that program and, and was just absolutely wonderful in it. Um, we could go on and on and on, but Maggie, take it away. Now, Maggie, your, le your, um, your lesson is going to be uh, preschool, right? Or yes. elementary oh kids. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So thank okay. you so much, Heather. I am really just so honored and excited to be with you all today. I'm going to share um, my screen here and get everything all blown up. So as Heather said, um, my lesson today is going to be, um, you know, we just had these lovely, lovely lessons for older children, teens, and actually I think they're perfect for most of the adults I know. And now we're sort of going to um, travel down to like really early conversations about race, which um, we often in We Stories kind of start by talking about same um, similarities and differences and really helping children notice at the youngest age, helping them notice skin color. So I thought this would be a good kind of juxtaposition to the, what, the older conversations, what it can look like. Um, at really young ages. So this could be um, early childhood or also um, even early elementary could I'm sure be adapted for other levels as well. So today's goal is in the lesson, if you all were my um, uh, young kids, would be to, at the end of this lesson, be able to name the three ways that people get their skin colors. So really rooting it in science, um, which we will use a children's book to dig into this. Being able to explain your own skin color um, with descriptive terms um, and be able to uh, create a, a skin color that matches your own using markers or crayons, markers don't mix very well, but so crayons, colored pencils or paint most likely. And one thing just for context setting that I probably would have done in advance of this lesson, definitely if we were in person, is I would have had a bunch of um, skin colored uh, markers, pencils, crayons, um, Play-Doh, a bunch of paints like out, um, wouldn't have the paints opened up yet, but give the kids an opportunity to just play around with them and say like, here, here's a bunch of um, different colors, you know, let them kind of pay attention to the way that they look and kind of just um, ground the lesson in that first. Uh, Crayola in particular has really expanded their, like the markers used to be an eight pack. And now these are, this is a 24 pack and they probably even have them bigger than that. Now I know the crayon pack has really expanded, which is wonderful. So one thing I would, um, invite you to do in your journal that Heather has you started there is, um, to share a hope or a worry that you would have in having conversations about skin color with young kids. So one thing you would hope would come out of it and one thing that makes you hesitate or concern or worry that you have. So if you can just take a moment to jot those down before we jump in. And if anyone feels comfortable sharing those in the chat, we would love to hear them because that um, definitely helps me as an educator and a, a parent and someone who's with young kids a lot, but probably also help others in the room as well. So the story I'm going to use today is called All the Colors We Are, the story of how we get our skin colors. So um, with this story, I think it works particularly well for kids that are like maybe in that um, pre-K range of like 
starting around four. There's some other ones I prefer to use for like two and three. And I have a bunch of books sitting next to me that I can share at the end. But really, I love uh, having a variety of a lot of different books that showcase different shades of skin color. Um, so I'll show you some of those at the end. People have many different colors of skin. Even though we often say the words he is black or she is white, all of us have skin that is a different shade of brown. This page has been a really important uh, base of conversations that my own two children and I have a lot. So I have a seven-year-old and I have a five-year-old, which I forgot to mention for context. Um, my seven-year-old especially will frequently refer to how confused he is, why, why, you know, why we refer to people as white and black, because even his own white skin is really not white. So it helps us have a lot of conversations about like, well, how would you describe it? What color is your skin? What name would you like to give the color of your skin? There are some great books that I love to add to this conversation and the fact that you all would have markers or crayons in front of you, um, I would probably have to help you read the names, but we can talk about how, um, you know, give some kids some potential uh, colors that they could think of. So this one is called Extra Deep Almond, Light Golden, Light Medium Almond. There was a terracotta I was looking at earlier, but giving them um, some examples with the colors and they're gonna play more with these colors as well. So that'll help um, expand their vocabulary over time. In the beginning, they're probably just gonna have a couple words. I mean, even adults struggle sometimes to describe um, what their skin color looks like. How do you think we get our own special color of skin? Can you make a guess? And I would invite, even though you all are adults in this room, um, I'd invite you to even kind of quiz yourself and jot down your thoughts here. And I um, would love if people want to throw that in the chat as well. And I would absolutely be asking kids out loud to share um, how they think we get it, because I love to see their thinking around that. I'm taking a quick look at the chat. Um, I, I see that one of the worries that was shared in the chat, I think is a really common worry around sharing unintentional bias. So we'll circle back to that. And then Heather, great point around the big words. I think that's one of the reasons I really like the way um, this book addresses some of the bigger concepts. So then we talk about how we get our skin color in three different ways. And we're gonna take a look at those three ways right now. We get them from our parents and from our relatives who lived long ago. We also, we often call these relatives ancestors. So from our parents and also people related to us that lived a long time ago. Things are passed down in our DNA, which are um, kind of recipes in our body, that um, genes that uh, help determine one of the ways that helps determine our skin color. From the sun is the second way. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens in a second. And as I navigate my, my Zoom box around the words on each page, um, and from something called melanin. And so here's a, a, a really smart scientific word that we're gonna talk about today, melanin. Has anyone heard that word before? What do you think it might mean? Melanin is tiny grains of coloring in our skin. We can't see the tiny melanin grains, but we all have melanin in our skin. So all of you sitting here right now have melanin in your skin and it's gonna behave differently in different people. If you have dark skin, the melanin in your body is very active. If you have light skin, the melanin in your body is not very busy. And neither, neither of these is a better way to be. So these are simply differences that create different skin colors, but one is not better um, or more desirable than the other. Freckles are spots on the skin that have a lot of melanin. I have a lot of freckles on my face that you probably can't see very well on Zoom. 
No matter what color we are, our skin gets darker in the sun. The more we are in the sun, the darker our skin will get. So the more time in the sun, it's speeding up the, the melanin there. The melanin is becoming more active. And that's why um, uh, it will uh, make our skin darker in a way that sometimes we refer, we refer to that as having a tan, a skin tan, when we know that our skin is darker from having spent a lot of time in the sun. Melanin's most important job is to protect our skin from sunburn. So if you're spending a lot of time out in the sun and your melanin is getting more active, um, that's actually working to help you from getting sunburn, which is pretty cool. And this book has lots of pictures of uh, children and adults with lots of different uh, skin colors and, and shades of brown. How does that happen? When we go outside, the sunshine in the air cause the melanin in our skin to get busy to keep our skin from burning. If we go out in the sun a little bit, at a time, we will build enough melanin to protect our skin. And a picture of uh, many different shades of brown there. If your ancestors from a long time ago lived in a place where there was a lot of sunshine and heat, they probably had dark skin. If they lived in a place with less sun and heat, they probably had light skin. And of course there's gonna be um, variations of all of, uh, of all of those. It's not, um, the colors are, uh, we'll as we'll take a look, look with the paints, they're going to have, um, different shades, even from a kid to their parent. When both parents have light skin, I would change the language here to say they often have children with light skin. So it says usually here. And one thing I would name because we often um, pair lessons about skin color and noticing similarities and difficulties. We also uh, talk a lot about families and how families can all uh, look very differently. They can be comprised of many in many different ways. And so um, the word usually doesn't um, doesn't feel uh, as good to me as saying they often have children with light skin or they can. When both parents have dark skin and same thing here, they often have children or they can have children with dark skin. If the kids were older, where we could talk, if this was, I mean, this book could actually even be used in a middle school lesson, being a middle school teacher um, by trade, um, be, then I feel like you could really bring in some cool stuff here um, that, you know, has to do with um, DNA and, and biology in that way. When one parent has light skin and one parent has dark skin, their children's skin may be like light, dark, or in between. The skin color we are born with comes from our parents and from our ancestors where they lived a long time ago. Do you think your ancestors came from a very warm, sunny place or from a cool place with less sunshine? And we can use this opportunity to really talk about different places on the map, because especially early childhood kids and, and lower elementary, they probably have less familiarity with the map. So we can really talk about how these um, darkest shades uh, are. We see a large spot here in Africa. We also have darker shade spots um, in other places as well. And then we really see um, different variations of the brown. And we see like the lightest shades of the brown, the furthest away from the equator. Dark skin, light skin, and skin with freckles are all caused by our parents and ancestors, the sun and melanin. So just reiterating um, those points to them. Skin color is one of the many ways people are special and different from one another. So when I have these conversations with um, my own children or other children that I'm working with as an educator, um, really rooting uh, our conversations in places of affirmation. So they're not being um, any value attached to the skin color in terms of um, something being prefer a shade being preferable over another and really having um, 
opening up the space for them to just talk about skin color. The research is really clear that when we don't talk about things such as differences in skin color or differences in lived experiences, it our kids are still noticing um, whether or not we realize it and they're making messages out of what they're noticing. So if my kids are naming um, skin color and I am hushing them up, that is sending them a message that there is something wrong or bad about skin color and they are less likely to, um, you know, have meaningful uh, conversations, nuanced conversations with me about the things they're noticing about um, the, the way that people are treated differently, the way that um, lived experiences could be different. And they're trying to make sense and make meaning, right? Like that's what we all are doing to an extent, but especially our young children as they're encountering so many things in the world um, for the first time. So really empowering them and making it comfortable for them to know that, yes, we can talk about these things. And it's like, it's great that you notice it. Um, one time someone made a comment to me about, uh, that, that was, uh, kind of helped me see things differently. Once someone said, uh, they were sharing that if someone said, cause I sometimes hear parents be like, oh my gosh, my kid said, um, you know, that man is black, for example. Um, and the person shared with me, would you hush your child being a white mom like myself? If your child said that person is white, the answer is no. I, but by hushing them when they're noticing something different, um, it can really send the message that that difference is bad. And so, um, you know, there's different ways to navigate it. And I don't pretend to be the expert or say that there's one right way, but um, I tend to recommend, or we do as an organization, that the affirmation of yes, that that is. Um, and if there are some harmful things said, you know, there can be a way to um, have conversations with your child in more private spaces. So if you, you know, you don't have to have publicly have a conversation about everything, you can circle back to things in the car. We often do, or say like, you know, I, uh, yes, it is. I'd love to talk to you more about our skin colors later. You know, if you're feeling like whatever, wherever that particular moment is, is catching you off guard. Um, it, you can always use that strategy of just affirming the question or the comment and, you know, making a comment that you'd love to talk more about it later. And that gives you a little bit of time to, first of all, it helps you, or, or if you don't know the answer, really acknowledging to your children that you don't know why something is the way that it is really helps them to understand it's okay to not know things. And, so, and it allows you an opportunity to uh, learn together. Heather's giving me a two minute warning. And I think, I think I've got it. Okay, so just to share a little bit um, about We Stories, uh, I shared a tiny bit in my bio, but um, would just love to um, ha have an opportunity to share for anyone who isn't familiar with us because we are a St. Louis based nonprofit, but over the past year we have expanded um, due to COVID, we've had to go virtual. So that has allowed us to open up to families all across the country. So we really work on um, the strategies rooted in research around how to counteract bias formation. So that's a whole nother pr presentation that I would, you know, love to share with you at any point, but just wanted you all to know um, the things I was mentioning really come from right out of the data and research around how early bias happens. There's some, there's often a misconception that my children don't notice race or skin color. They think everyone's the same. And there's research that really says um, there's, I mean, it's kind of um, disturbing research around particularly that one, the bottom right one really catches some people, hits people hard around white children as young as seven, demonstrating that they believe blacks experience less pain than whites um, always hits hard. Um, and just knowing children as young as three make distinctions about race um, and, and are more likely to attribute positive attributes to their own racial group. So it's happening. They're becoming racialized, whether or not you want them to. <laughs> They're receiving racial messages from everywhere. Um, and so having some tools to be able to help counteract that can really help folks feel more empowered and less like um, hopeless and um, powerless, essentially. So that's what we work to do. And um, I would follow this lesson up. The last thing I'll say, one of my favorite things to do is to take lots of different shades of brown um, paints and really help kids um, determine the recipe for their skin color. So if I know, like if I squirt some um, 
of a, of a particular bottle, you know, these would be labeled with the colors. Um, and I know it takes two, two parts of this color and one part of this color and three parts of this color. I like to keep track of that recipe for the kid so that when we're mixing to do painting and stuff, they can create, um, their own skill or skin color based on, um, the correct, you know, as close as they can get quantities of the different browns. And then the last thing I'll say is just having those different supplies available to them at all times, the, the different crayons, the colored pencils, the different colored construction paper of all different shades of brown, the paints, so that whenever they're creating anything, um, they're able to access uh, all the different shades because they, they will hope they will hopefully be including not only their own skin color and the positive, you know, um, having positive attributes about that. But I noticed how often my children are incorporating different shades on different characters in their stories. So really helping normalize different shades of skin. So that probably took me right up maybe a second over, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to have one last three minute writing period. And then after that, we're gonna open up for questions for all three of our panelists. So let's begin now. Okay, time is up. So now let's invite all four of our panelists, or excuse me, three of our panelists back. And um, our host here, Cynthia, she has been monitoring some of the questions, et cetera. So Cynthia, do you wanna go ahead and ask some of those? Okay, um, a few of the questions have been answered kind of as we go along. So I will kind of skip those to begin with and we'll see where we head back. So um, I, the first question that I have is for Brittany. And it is how important would it be to establish how indigenous groups used or occupied the land, e.g. agriculture, villages and cities, trade routes, burial mounds, et cetera. What about the groups before the seven that you identified? Yes, and I'm so glad that that was brought up um, because that was something that concerned me a little bit in my research that I was having trouble finding. I know that I had read that they... Um, that indigenous groups migrated and that who we recognize were not necessarily the original group, but I, def I definitely didn't find the name. So I was actually glad that that was placed in the chat. And then I, I always, when I taught, and even now as I speak to, is encourage people to continue to study and to do research, especially when it comes to history. Like you have to have a good relationship with um, the library, historical societies, so that you can like really dig in deep. And then another thing that was really powerful when I did teach fourth grade is that they really like to meet the people that we're, we're, we were talking about. And so that challenged me as an educator to get out and network and try to find people or find someone that knew someone. So it wasn't just about them reading and them, they wanted to experience and actually have conversations with people. And I think that 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 is key, bringing um, someone actually from the community that has that knowledge, that has that expert so they can speak to it. Because I know I don't know it all. That's the beauty of being an educator. We're constantly learning. And I think teaching students that, hey, the book doesn't stop, stop with me. It starts with me. And to encourage them to learn more and to dig more. But I was really grateful for that comment because I'm like, okay, I can add that in because I really had a hard time finding it. And that was pretty frustrating. And I wouldn't even share that with my students. Like I was researching these things and I didn't find it. Um, what are some other ways? I think also the point made there about talking about how the land was used because sometimes we have a perception that they were just hanging out there and not not doing things um, it, it, the land was being underutilized somehow okay then another question for Brittany while we're here um it says great lesson I love the kids get to dig for their own info and facts then the question comes um is there other work done earlier in the learning cycle to help you discern and decipher which sites may be filtering info or ignoring certain facts and so forth? So about the research question. Yes. Um, so <laughs> talking about a hard teacher lesson, I learned real quick 
that I needed to teach my students how to research when I like did a lesson and I, and I want to be like, oh, probably like, no, this is early in my career. No, hunty. It was like my fourth year. And I, and I went in, I just knew my fifth graders could hint. And when I got what I, I said, oh, I need to bring it back and teach them how to do research and, and how to, and, and what to look for in, in websites and materials. So yes. I definitely that and actually it's not a one timer that I feel like it takes like a solid week or two to really teach students how to research and how to read and ask questions of the text and um, all those great, great skills that they need to be really critical thinking and critical researchers. So absolutely. All right. Thank you. Our next question is for Chloe. What other norms do you establish that help students of all backgrounds engage from an empowered perspective? Could you share the ones that you presented in the presentation? Sure. Well, first of all, let me see if I can. Actually, I think that was my question. I kind of was asking it in general and it could apply to everyone, but it was in response to Brittany's um, presentation, but it, it ended up being one that translated across all three presentations like what norms do all any of you share in order to make sure that kids feel comfortable well first of all i don't set the norms i let them do it part of the uh community building aspect of classrooms if we're going to be about equity and about challenging uh illegitimate hierarchies the first thing we have to do is recognize that our students have a voice so we get together and we set our norms. And what's funny is sometimes the kids' norms are stricter than yours. You're like, well, dog, I, didn't I wasn't going to add that rule, but since you mentioned it, oh, okay. And then you're secretly trying to add it to other classes where you didn't have it. But they set the norms. And the first thing they'll say is we want to feel respected. And then we say, what does that look like, Right. And then we turn around and talk about the language that we use. We use those, we use those prompts, by the way. Thank you for kind of pulling my coattails on that one slide. Um, we use that language to set the norms. And I mean, students will call each other out. I have a sixth period that is phenomenal. You, you want some future we story folks, some OE folks, the sixth period. Just saying. I love it. Um, we used to do when I was still in the classroom, and I actually have this particular lesson on my website on, on in purpose educational services website where we do uh, um, a norms and expectations um, activity. And we I always did it at the beginning of each semester, where same thing, the kids themselves would set up what our classroom contract would be. And that would be something that I myself would sign and also have to um, agree to because I was in um, covenant with them. And it, it got down to things like respect. How do you want um, to be addressed? You know, so yes, I'm in the teacher role, but at the same time, if I'm the, the best way for me to show you respect or to teach you respect is to demonstrate it myself. Maggie, would you like to add anything about norms? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with um, what Chloe and Heather just shared. Um, I think th the only thing I would add just like for for younger kiddos, and I think I know that they would say the same for older because um, I know all both of the other educators spoke to it in their lessons, but um, really uh, demonstrating to the children of, of how we don't root things in shame. So they might not be familiar with that shame word yet, but by helping model for them that I, that by responding in curiosity, you know, tell me, tell me more about what makes you think that. So for example, a kid might say something that is racist and in, instead of, um, you know, shutting down the conversation, I mean, it, it really, this is like a hypothetical. So I'm thinking there can be many exceptions, but really trying often to root it in curiosity so that it can open up a conversation. So if a child says something um, that's showing a bias that they have, 
uh, it's a great opportunity to say by saying, tell me, you know, what makes you say that it helps you see their reasoning around it. And then that can help you deconstruct it. So if they're making that connection because of something they're assuming about the other person or something they saw somewhere else, it gives you an opportunity to, um, learn with them and help tease that apart. I've definitely had situations where a kid has said something that's made me be like, and then when I heard their listening around it, I realized I maybe was having a knee jerk reaction into assuming that they were meaning something differently than what they said. So I think like keeping an open mind and teaching the kids to do that too, and teaching them how to ask respectful questions and show respect and um, not shame others uh, and um, respond in curiosity. And then I would just do everything else, Chloe um, and Brittany shared as well. <laughs> and Heather. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, this is a little series of questions for Chloe. What would come next in your lesson after this demonstration? Okay. So, first of all, and it depends on what context it's in. Uh, if it's the first couple of weeks of school, it'll kind of be like a getting to know you. Uh, what I want to do is always emphasize individuality and community. So if it were the first couple of weeks, this would be a getting to know you. Uh, the students would pair off with each other and tell each other and tell a story to the other that they wouldn't mind sharing. And they would use those questioning concepts. Uh, sometimes the students will model for the class what that looks like, because some of them brag that they can do it better than others. I said, OK, I guess humility wasn't one of our expectations, but here we are. So they'll model it to other students. So if it's a getting to know you that I use it kind of in isolation, but then now as the school year keeps going, I'll say, Hey guys, remember that listening activity we use? Now we're about to start reading a text. How can we convert some of these questions over to listening to someone who doesn't have the power to talk back to you, which is what a text is. So then they begin to start converting those questions over to more reading aspects. Like for example, the one, uh, one uh, stem, what struck me most, you can use that reading any text. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this is what stood out to me. It forces them to ask questions beyond the text. Okay. And then if it were writing, I would say, okay, class, we're going to use those same questions. And we're going to use, I use these questions in everything. I even use this for peer editing and writing. Everything. Because once they learn how to listen, they can listen for understanding. And, and you're, you know, and you can disagree on your own time, but the biggest challenge we're having right now is teaching people how to listen. Thus, you have pushback against CRT in 1619 because folks haven't listened. Okay. Another mm -hmm. question. Is this well, I think you just answered that one. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um what are some ways I could frame my conversations or presentations to help students listen? Mm, we maybe answered that one also. I, I think you just answered that very well. Let me move on. Sorry. Um, a question for Maggie. Do your kids ever express feelings of shame because of their skin color? That's a great question because of the current um, ecosystem that we're in right now, where uh, a lot of the messaging that I see related to being against lessons that um, are about equity or that name the word diversity or um, are trying to move us away from being able to name differences and, and including different lived experiences is so much rooted in fear around um, you know, shaming, I've been saying that word a lot today, but like, you know, shaming white students or um, making them feel responsible. And I can't remember if it was Brittany or Chloe that was sharing earlier around, um, I think Chloe, you were saying like, this is about um, like moving forward and not about assigning past blame. And also um, because of the approach we take and really just embracing differences and acknowledge, acknowledging differences and embracing them. And the, we really root things in affirmation around how, who we are and how we're all different. Um, I, I don't, 
I cannot think of a time where my, where my children, like my own personal children, um, exhibited pain around race. We've definitely had some harder conversations with like the seven-year-old, right? Because you start out, you're talking about like differences and things uh, and affirmation. And as they get older, you're able to, to, um, layer more topics on including, um, past inequities and racism, but making sure to tie that to the current day. Like there are ways that these things, um, whatever we're reading about in this particular book, while it might not look this same way today, this exists in a different way in X, Y, and Z, um, and being able to talk about that. So we don't, um, shy away from talking about harder things, but I rooted in, um, kind of the, this is the way that things are. So this is actually why our family takes these actions to help work towards things being better in the future. So it's like acknowledging hard things because it doesn't do, you know, even my white children, it doesn't do them any service to shield them from, um, you know, realities or truths, or um, I want to give them the skills because they're going to need some real critical thinking and problem solving skills. um, This next generation, I'm very, you know, scared about what's going to happen. Just like in the environment, for one example. Um, so they're, they are going to have to work with people that are different than them. They're going to have to think about, um, how to make, you know, the world a better place. And so the best way to me to do that is by giving them the skills and tools to be able to talk about hard things and think about what's my place in the story. So like, how can, um, you know, how does this, um, connect to me personally and what kinds of things can we do as a family in the places that we're in? that can make steps towards change because um, it's not an option in our family to just um, turn our heads and pretend like it doesn't affect us because racism uh, equally, or not equally, that's not the right word I was looking for. Racism impacts white folks in a derma- in a um, detrimental way as well. And a lot of times, um, you know, that isn't highlighted, but it, racism is this, it, it's a disease of sorts that uh, affects um, white people too. And so um, we want to be able to uh, work against that as much as possible. So we approach it from an empowering way of what are the things you can do. And I think that Maggie said something really, really important is that, you know, one of the the biggest um, things that people are saying in response to this, you know, CRT and, oh, is, is about their children being uncomfortable. And the reality is that we ask our kids to be uncomfortable all the time in our classrooms, in gym in sports and like we asked our kids to do stuff all the time that's going to make them uncomfortable so why is it a good reason to go through and wholesale ban any learning about diverse groups because kids will be uncomfortable if and so that's what we have to start when we're when we're responding to some of these we have to just start naming things as they are um i i saw some questions in there related to how do you respond to da, da, da. i honestly at this point um, initially, when this whole thing began, we were confused because, you know, if this is CRT. CRT, what is CRT? Um, so we were really, really confused about it. And so our initial reaction was, we don't teach CRT. Um, when the reality is what we should have been saying in response is, here, here are the five tenets of CRT. Which one of these are untrue? Which one of these do you disagree with? And um, soon on my website, um, Missouri Equity Education Partnerships website, www.missouriequity.com, we're going to have, we already have on there, if you join our member area, it's a free membership. If you join it, we already have on there like playbooks that you can use. They give you some of the wording around this, but we're getting ready to also publish a third playbook that talks about, well, no, wait a minute. We've got to stop being on the defense about the reality is being on the right side of history. 
Because another thing that Maggie said, and then I'll wrap up, another thing that Maggie said that was so very, very true. Our children have got to learn how to work with diverse groups of people. It's not an option. The reason why it's not an option is because um, Brittany and Chloe, I don't know about you, but I'm not going anywhere. Right? Yeah. And Heather, can I, can I, let me do an input. So when I was speaking to a parent one day talking about multiculturalism and he was talking about test scores and all, I said, when I go, when I do my research in any country that's in the top test scores, you know, what sort of curriculum they use a culturally responsive curriculum because it involves critical thinking. So America, part of your problem is you continue to use this curriculum that's outdated, out of time, out of source, and need to just be thrown in the trash can. And our kids are not able to compete with these other countries, you know, because you want to stay stuck in your ways. And they can't was, compete. In yeah. China, they tell, in math, they literally take models from other cultures and look at how they can synthesize we over here still hollering well, let's go back to two plus two only and then wonder why we can't compete with that no you can't compete with that <laughs> oh gosh i love this woman so much uh, and that's exactly the truth and that was what i was going to say so if missouri if these laws are implemented we're automatically setting not just because th the intention is to throw BIPOC children under the bus in the interest of, of political expediency. Let's just be real. But not only will we do that, um, we're going to set not just our black and brown kids behind, we're going to set our white children behind too, because colleges and universities, cor um, corporations, especially global um, corporations, they need people who are culturally competent. And if you're not culturally competent, we're getting ready to be to, to put you at a disadvantage to be um, able to number one get into the company and then number two to progress to to promote up. So we've got to we've got to think in those terms that yes, for the time being, it may be like a real you know oh I I really stuck it to BIPOC children, but it's going to negatively impact all children, and that's the problem is that. I, and I say this all the time, my calling, my, um, my, my passion calls for me to think about all children. Everyone on this call thinks about all children. And, and there are individuals who think more about specific sets of children at the sacrifice of others, I cannot morally do that. Okay, Maggie, you, you've been trying to speak. <laughs> Keep talking. No, I just wanted to add something onto what you all are saying that connects to what I was saying before as well. Um, by talking, by making sure that um, diverse points of view and diverse people in like every aspect of that word are representative in the, of course, in our classrooms, but also folks can work on this in their own homes and other spaces. Um, it helps build po more um, positive images of difference as well. So it's affirming to the students and the children and the adults who see themselves, but it also helps um, normalize the fact that there are, you, if you intentionally do it in a way, well, let me take a state step back. If the way that our curriculum has really historically been taught from this um, white centered perspective and not really highlighting um, successful people of color in many ways and, and successful movements and um, things like that, it really does is a travesty to all children when they only hear about people of color in these negative con. Uh, um, in these ways that have negative connotations or negative stories that are being told. So really working to include resources and stories that really help uplift people of color and show affirmative um, stories about them 
is a benefit to the students of color, but it's also a benefit to the white students. So one of our favorite books in our home is um, called Ron's Big Mission, and it's about Ron McNair, the first black astronaut. And what is funny about that is we have that book and we have um, Mae Jemison. And I actually don't know if my kids could name um a white astronaut, which I didn't really think about that until this moment, but that doesn't make them, it's, it, we don't say like white people can't be astronauts, but the, but the, at the end of the day, they're going to encounter white astronauts in other places. I want to make sure that they have a wider view of what that is. And so we've intentionally made sure to include other folks that they may not see in other places. And I'm terrified to think about what Heather's talking about of my children being so young and getting ready and what they're going to be encountering in public education. If all of these perspectives are shut down, that means I have to work even harder to make sure that they're getting those perspectives, um, in our home. And it feels, um, problematic on every level. So just want to reiterate Heather's point there. I think Chloe's going to drop some knowledge right now. And can we talk about the quality of white people? Our kids keep studying. Oh, let's go and okay, since we want to talk <laughs> white people, let's do this. Why do we think that the only white people our kids need to hear about are a bunch of conquerors, uh, people who have stolen from others and people who culturally appropriate without shame? There are plenty of good white people that our history books are not mentioning and your kids are not getting access to them. And look at the results of the sort of white folks we've had in history books. Look no further than our lawmakers. They are the dead reason. Listen, Chloe, (laughs) educational institution needs to be charged with white supremacy because of what they have sent to our lawmakers and everywhere because they have set up and taught them this old tired curriculum where the only white folks are a bunch of conquerors, a bunch of thieves, and they, they don't want to teach about the white people who have set up and given their lives, honestly, who have made sure. See, people don't want to get me started. You Okay, you want your white child to not feel ashamed? <laughs> okay, let's try this white person instead of that one. I think that that is ends up being really important, uh, and that is one of the things that right now, as we're engaging in these conversations, um, that I am making sure that we do is to put make sure that we put all voices forward as pro equity because it, it tends to be um, framed as you know black versus white or bipoc versus white people, and it absolutely is not. Um, The whole reason why the Missouri Equity Education Partnership started was because I read that bill and my friends were named in it. We Stories was named in it. I I got mad about all of it, but it's like, wait a minute. And this is an organization that was begun by white women that is run by white women. Uh, I mean, you guys have different, a diverse staff, but at the same time, and they concentrates on how to teach white families. That's because this is important across the board. And we have to start thinking in terms of, well, wait a minute, why would you try to ban white families from voluntarily participating in a program that's set up for white families by white families. Why would you do that? So that's where we have to start thinking through some of this stuff. It's not just an attack on African-Americans or not just an attack on um, you know, LGBTQ people. This, these types of bills and this anti-CRT movement is a t- an attack on the ability for us to learn about one another. And that's where the concern continues to be. Um, because again, there's so many false, so many pieces of false information being put out about what equity work is. Um, okay. Um, Cynthia, go ahead. Your discussion amongst yourselves is answering all of the questions that I have actually. Uh Um, there is one, there is a lot of, we hear a lot of people saying this about 
they use a little stronger word than you, your uncomfortable word of saying that students sometimes are traumatized in these discussions. All of you are educators and have done lessons like this with students. Have you ever experienced traumatized students in these situations? I haven't. Um, and I was going to speak to that specifically because um, I taught this particular lesson um, not with the depth that the 1619 project brings. So I'm like, dang, I wish I would have had this. That would have added another layer of rigor and depth. But when I taught the lesson, what more surprised my students was they were confused about what happened historically and how they can conceive the connections of what's happening presently. And they couldn't reconcile like, but this is my friend, this is my classmate. Why, why, why would they do that? So they're, so if anything, it was hard for me as a teacher <laughs> to try to explain, like, how do you explain that, you know? And so it really it was really giving them the space to kind of talk in and um, almost <laughs> process th their confusion. That they, they, they were very literally confused. And I was just like, there's hope. <laughs> because they just really couldn't understand why like it didn't make sense to them so that was really really more what I saw and then even from parents which is why I'm also interested about these specific parents I didn't even get pushback from parents and mind you like I low-key was doing some pro problematic things but the thing is I was challenging my students to think I wasn't telling them necessarily what I thought per se but I was challenging them to think and I would bring in text and I feel like is through reading that it expounds a lot more than me talking anyway. So we were reading books and they brought up questions and things. And that's how our read alouds end up like bleeding over into our lessons because they wanted to keep talking about these things and from the books that I would bring. And that was another thing I wanted to point out and then I'll pass the mic is that I would read books that had diff that represented students. So my main characters look like everybody in my at class at some point. So I had students that with the white character or white male or <laughs> biracial female, I made sure that in the books that we were reading, they were like, oh, okay, this character looks like me. And it gave them the opportunity to think and interrogate, okay, my, my identity and how I view myself and how people view me. And, and, and then that also gave us a way to kind of celebrate each other's differences as well. But yeah, this, the kids were really confused. They were like, I don't understand why. And, and parents, they didn't complain. And I was like, I'm doing some problematic stuff and y'all not saying nothing. Okay. Can you say <laughs> some more about that, Brittany? I was going to ask you to clarify because I think there's like this, um, uh, like misconception that we're doing all these like nefarious things or something with equity education. So when you say low, low key problematic things, I don't, I, I would love, are you saying that as in like, you know, clarify why you're, what, what you're talking about when you say that? Sure. So I would say low key problematic things in this sense that no one else in my school building, except for myself and another teacher were using those type of material. So it was definitely, um, against the typical culture that was in, in the school. And so that's what I'm saying, it, it was problematic. And, um, and even like something as simple as we didn't do, like on Columbus Day, I didn't teach a whole lesson on, on Columbus. And I was like, we don't celebrate colonizers. And then we all like laughed about it. <laughs> and like the students, and then we went on about our business. Whereas like everybody else besides the other two teachers, everybody else did a lesson on Columbus Day. And, and I was like, and then now, you know, we don't even use that term anymore. And so that's what I was saying. It was it was problematic in in the sense of how it was viewed in the rest of the school culture. But the students and the parents had no had no issues. And usually when I would get a complaint, it was someone that wasn't even in my it wasn't even in my class or any of the parents. So it was always very confusing. I'm like, OK, so why are you complaining? And it's not your child. It's not your class. But anyways, so, yes, that's what I mean. It was low key problematic because it was countercultural to the building. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, radical even to the building. Right. <laughs> um, what one thing that um, I was going to mention was. Um, you know, all of when we talk about this legislation um, in particular that seeks to, you know, and these book bans within school districts that seek to censure stories and perspectives. Um, and then also when it comes to the legislation at the state level, um, one of the most basic question frames that we teach our families um, that engage with us is really 
um, these two simple questions around who is present and who is missing. And those questions can be so, so powerful in lots of different spaces. And so like it, everything from teachers looking at, you know, what books are present in my classroom, like who, what voices are present, what images are present and what, and, and who is missing um, all the way up to like in the curriculum, um, what perspective am I not hearing? Like who's present in this story, who isn't present um, in particular, who's telling the story and am I hearing the other, you know, sides of the story to like conversations walking around in neighborhoods or in um, businesses that you uh, frequent, you know, who's present in this space and who isn't. We had a really powerful conversation. I did a little presentation for a Girl Scout troop. Um, and they, the Girl Scout troop is located in a school district that is predominantly white. And we had a really rich discussion around who was present in the community and who was missing and why that could be. And this was a, this was a, um, group of third grade girls, but we were able to talk about, you know, it included a lot of question asking on my part, but it also included a little lesson on uh, at a third grade level about things like, did you actually know that in this community, in this school district, there, there were actually laws that kept people out of purchasing homes here. Did you actually know that there were maps that were drawn that really made it um, not possible for people with dark skin, for black folks to buy homes? And those effects are still felt today. Um, and, and being able to talk about those things, you can absolutely break down concepts in a way where you can say there were laws that made it impossible for, for people to buy homes here that didn't have white skin. And those effects still show up in these ways. And you can break down concepts that can feel um, pretty big into pretty simple ways if you just take a, a, a little bit of time to think about how can I bring this on their level. And I just, I really, those questions, who's present and who's missing have come up just so many times in, co in conversations with um, my own children. So I know that we are at time. Um, and I really hate that we didn't, this is such a good conversation. This is how I felt last time. It was like, we're not done yet. Um, this was such a good conversation. And so Cynthia, did you have anything that you wanted to follow up and say? or anything before we um, let people go? Well, I definitely want to thank all of you who've been participating with us today and all the people who have um, been on our panel. I also wanna put a little plug for next Saturday at the same time, there is a Braver Angels debate on this subject about teaching of race in schools. It will be a little different um, tenor to the conversation. We'll have people Front with a variety of viewpoints about it. And I'm hoping that um, listening to one another that we'll learn some of the things, we'll send that link and information about that out to the people who have been um, in this presentation. So you can anticipate that. Thank you very much to all of you participants and Heather, what, however you wanna wrap up, go right ahead. So I wanna wrap up by encouraging people to, number one, um, if you are interested in learning more about protecting equity, um, please visit our website, www.missouri, spell out Missouri, equity.com. Um, Maggie, if you want to give them the way to contact uh, We Stories if they're interested. Sure. Um, our website is westories.org. So W-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S dot O-R-G. Uh, we also share a lot of content on Instagram and you can follow us on Facebook as well. My email I can throw in the chat. It's my first name, Maggie at westories.org. I got you, Maggie. And thank you so much. Um, pleasure to be here today. Okay, and, and please, when you visit that page, look for, um, if you want to share your stories, um, look for a drop down tab. Miss Chloe is leading a, um, a project for um, MoWeep where we are collecting stories, student stories. And so um, if you, you or your family or your um, student child want to share their story, then please, um, we have three prompts that you can write from and um, yeah, there's a lot of work to do y'all. 
And the, the biggest thing to understand is that no matter what you, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, there is something that you could do. If you have 15 minutes a week, we have something for you to do. If you have 15 hours a week, we have something for you to do, okay? And Brittany, we wanna wish you lots of luck as you finish up your EDD. Um, so thank you. Thank everyone for having us and, and um, taking the time to listen. If you have any questions, we have dropped some of our information in there so you can get in touch with us. All right, bye everyone.